Okay, here we are. It's Verna from Drayton Valley Library coming to you on Facebook. And I've got with me some of our local authors that we are going to be talking to today. They've all uh, written some books that are published that are available for purchase. And it's kind of cool. Like this is unique, right? Because not everybody else gets to talk to you. This is like, you want to hear from these people? you got to come here mostly. I mean, I know Vaughn, he's out there a little bit doing some more chatting. But for Michelle and Eunice, I think this is a pretty unique experience too. So if you've joined us, wonderful. Um, we're going to start out by just getting to know these authors a little bit. So sometimes I got a peek because how it shows up on my Zoom screen and Facebook is a little bit different. But beside me, I believe, is Eunice, Eunice Matchett. And she's got, I think, three books out right now that are yes. published. Okay, and we'll look a little bit more at those later. And then we've got underneath me, I believe, is Vaughn Eric Tandok, who's got his first book out. And Kitty Corner, We've got Michelle Naren. Did I say that right, Michelle? You sure did. Naren. Okay. And she's got her first book out as well. So if we were in person, I was going to ask the audience to help out with this and, and read some facts about the authors and try and guess who, which author has which facts matching to them. But since we can't quite do it that way, um, we're going to play this game with the authors. So we've all got the names written down on individual papers, like so, like so. And I'm gonna read out a fact about one of the authors and all three authors are going to put up the name for which one they think oh. it goes to. Now, here's the thing though. Like if Vaughn holds his up and says Vaughn, we're gonna be like, oh, okay, it's Vaughn. Like, so. Here's what I think. If you want to tell a lie <laughs> in this case, <laughs> if it's you and you want to be sneaky and pretend it's someone else, you can do that just for fun. Okay. But if you want to put it up or yeah, it, I'll, I'll let you guys just play for fun, however you want to do it. And then at the end, I'm going to reveal who it actually was. All right. So we've asked um, a couple questions to each of the authors here. And just making sure I've got my questions here. Okay, so we're going to start with, who do you think was born in Rocky Mountain House? Who do you think was born in Rocky Mountain House? Hold it up. Okay, now I've got to make sure I got mine ready. Which one was it? It was... Eunice. Ah. So if you got it right, just feel good. I'm not going to keep track of points because it's too much for me to handle. Okay. So then let's also ask, now we know where Eunice was born. So Michelle, where were you born? Drayton Valley. So Michelle is born and raised right here, but Rock Mountain House is not too far off. We're going to ask where people were raised in just a second too. And Vaughn, where were you born? was born 10,000 miles away from Canada, the Philippines. <laughs> he was born in the Philippines. Well, that's kind of cool. We've got right here and from far away as well. Okay, so next question was, uh, where were you raised? So I'm going to ask, who was raised near Tomahawk? Hmm. I think... Oh, Michelle was being tricky. It was Michelle. That was Michelle just was Tomahawk. So born in Drayton, raised near Tomahawk. So did that happen like you came into the hospital in Drayton to be born, but your home was actually out near Tomahawk? That's or? correct. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. Okay, that makes sense then. And then I didn't ask Eunice's because she was raised in the same place she was born. <laughs> The Rocky Mountain, so that would be a giveaway. And uh, same for Vaughn. He was raised in the Philippines, so that would have been a dead giveaway. Okay, let's try another one. The next question was, where do you currently call home? All right, let's see which one I want to do. Okay, who says Drayton Valley is currently home? Eunice. Eunice. Okay. 
So what I had from your writing was Michelle and Eunice, right? Uh, called Drayton Valley Home. But now Vaughn, you gave me a different answer. Do you remember what you wrote? I, I put in general Canada. That's yeah. what I remember, yeah. In, or yeah. Alberta. I think Alberta or yeah. Alberta, <laughs> Canada. But I believe you are living in Drayton Valley. Yes. Now, but you kind of see the bigger picture when you um, get asked that question <laughs> with that kind of answer. Okay. So now the next one, because we are celebrating Alberta Culture Days, this one was related to Alberta. So I was asking if people have favorite hangout spots in Alberta, like somewhere that they like to visit, maybe vacation or um, just hang out. Okay, so this one I'm going to pick here. Favorite hangout spot, who do you think likes Jasper and Banff as their favorite hangout spot in Alberta? Just waiting for one more there. Oh, hold yours up a little, Eunice. I, we can't quite see. Oh, there. Okay. Oh, you're right, Eunice. It was Vaughn. And Vaughn was being tricky. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Jasper and Bamp, I love that too. I mean, I don't go there that often, but when you get the chance, it's beautiful. Now, Eunice, do you remember what you said? What's your favorite book? I believe I said I like to go back to Prairie Creek, where um, I grew up in a farm in the Prairie Creek Stracken District, and I love to go back there around the camp at the creek and picnic and all that there stuff. It makes me feel young again. <laughs> there you go. Go back to the place awesome. of your youth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Vaughn's like, yeah, good. But I made him say an Alberta one. Do you get to go home sometimes to the Philippines there, Vaughn? I should get yeah. home, Canada. I shouldn't have said that. Do you get to go back? Three, to the Philippines three years sometimes? ago, supposed to be this year, but mm. because yeah. of our situation, so cancel, cancel. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's great when you get a chance, yeah. though, but sometimes it's not the same exactly, you know, because they say you can't go back. Right. But still, it helps bring those memories from when you were there. Yes. And how about you, Michelle? Where do you like hanging out in Alberta? I can't remember what I said, but oh, I, I think, yeah, <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah, I do like to. Uh, I, I'm kind of a hermit in a way, and I do enjoy spending time alone, but near water. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that. You had um, Ivanto Park. You like walking by Avanto Park in town here? Oh, yes, and finding, that's the pond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and finding nature paths, new paths in nature. And I wasn't sure about this place, Kauai? K-A-U-A-I? Oh, Kauai in Hawaii, the oh. island of Kauai. <laughs> Except for it's not in Alberta, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we talked that. about the Philippines, <laughs> so it's only fair. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. All right. Okay, so next question I had is what is your favorite thing about being an El about Alberta or being an Albertan? Okay, so favorite thing about Alberta or being an Albertan. So who do you think said the fighting spirit of Albertans, openness and diversity in the people? Their favorite thing, the fighting spirit of Albertans, openness and diversity in the people. Who do you think said that? Okay. Oh, man. Someone's not telling the truth. It was Michelle. It was Michelle. Uh, I can't see that these days, the fighting spirit of Albertans. Hey, yeah. we're very strong minded, <laughs> <laughs> which can be positive, but can have challenges too. Um, so how about then for Eunice? Do you remember what you said? No. Okay, I can read it for you. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> She's like, what was I thinking? Um, she said, she, oh, and you're kind of close to what Michelle said there. The tenacious spirit within oh. Alberta. Oh, so okay. that's pretty close. That yeah. sounds like me. <laughs> and the pioneer optimism our forefathers possessed to lay the foundation for the province we became still resides in Alberta. So we've got optimism to add there for Albertans, okay? And I think we need that 
that's important to have some <laughs> yeah. optimism, right? And Vaughn, do you remember what you said? I'm looking at the email. At the email, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can help but, you. <laughs> you said I, the lakes, the lakes in our province that you can visit oh, the yeah. water, yeah. and maybe okay. Michelle would agree with you there. I <laughs> sure would. <laughs> Being by the water. I like that too. Yes. And then there, there's critters, like the birds come and stuff. I like that. Um, okay. And we've got two more things, but we might only do one of them in the game way. Okay. Actually, I think everybody did end up answering that question. Nope, not everybody did. So one more question for the game. So this one's a little bit, dare I ask this, eh? if you were in charge of Alberta, what would you change? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I know it's like, why did I ask that question? Okay. Um, who will I give here? How, oh, I like this answer. Okay. Who do you think said, if they're in charge of Alberta, they would Listen to the people who put me in charge and consider all angles before making a concrete answer. Who do you think said that? Listen to the people who put me in charge and consider all angles before making a concrete answer. It was <laughs> She was being tricky there. All yeah. right. I hope you know, that leaders will do that, but it is a challenging job. We gotta listen to everybody and we're all strong-willed and we all have an opinion and then you gotta try to make everyone happy. Oh, it's so tough. So um, do you, let's ask Vaughn, do you remember what you said for that one? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. If I'm in charge of Alberta, I would like to create more tourism spot in a small community like uh, Drayton Bali, Kalmar, so across all the tourism spots are in Calgary, right, mm. big cities, or probably in Sylvan Lake. So we need to have it in the small community as well. So more tourism so that people get out to those small communities and support them. Yeah. And I think, you know, Drayton's been trying to do so. I think, though, Drayton might be like sort of. A hidden treasure in some ways like because for the nature that's around here and the things we have but not everybody knows but once you get out here and see it it's like wow it's pretty nice um how about Eunice do you remember you were kind of like I'm not sure you said oh that's my senior brain is fried <laughs> <laughs> but you actually said for your answer that you weren't sure how to answer this Right, because the province is always changing, and there's individual opinions. I think it's a hard question to answer. It is. Right? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, and then this is the last one I asked about, and we'll just let you share if you had something you wanted to share here. Which was, do you have any other interesting Alberta connections that you would like to share? So. Um, Michelle, you didn't put anything down, but if you had something you wanted to say, you could say it. I don't know if you thought of anything. Or should I let the other guys go first? And then yeah, can we do that? Okay. Was, yeah. <laughs> then you'll be like, yeah, I, now I know what that question means. Okay, so how about you, Eunice? Do you want me no, to read it? let's go Vaughn first. He's oh, Vaughn. <laughs> you remember what you wrote, Vaughn. Yeah, the connection that I have is in 2008, 2009, that was the time Alberta needs more foreign worker outside of Canada. And I feel that connection because they needed us. If the Alberta province that time is not booming, then probably I'm not here. My family is not here. I mentioned this is already home for me. So we decided to stay here in Drayton Valley because this is home. We decided to stay. So that's the connection. The Alberta government needed foreign worker. And you answered the call. Yes, that's there right. we go awesome all right you ready now Eunice to remember oh, I don't remember what I said I'm drawing a blank I'll read it it was great what you wrote you said my father came to Alberta in 1929 after years of working for other farmers he homesteaded his own land in the Strachan Prairie Creek district which is where I grew up for my first three years of school I rode horseback 
two and one half miles to Pleasant to Pleasant Vale, a one room raised one to nine country schoolhouse. I think that's cool. I love like history and and hearing about pioneer days and, and things like the one room schoolhouse and everything like that. So I think that's awesome. It was a little cold in the winter. I believe it. Even though I think it's awesome, I do think it was hard <laughs> because we we have more conveniences and things these days. But you know, that sort of romantic idea in my head of <laughs> take out the negatives. I uh, thought. About mm -hmm. two weeks ago, there's 11 of us girls that went to that schoolhouse, still alive, and we all got together for a, you know, girls reunion. And yes. it was just so super, you know, sharing all the crazy memories and yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. We were rockers. It's a good thing our kids weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was a teacher and sometimes I wonder if those kids will grow up and go, Oh, I remember how I used to behave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, did you have an idea for that one, Michelle? Any Alberta connection you want to share? I guess uh, just locally, like my dad used to work in, in uh, the oil and gas, and I am now too. <laughs> I'm not an operator. I'm just an admin in the office, but still in the same industry, and I've got family spread all over Alberta. I have a niece in Beaver Lodge and sister in St. Albert and, and family close by here too as well. So. And Beaver Lodge has a great big beaver, right? <laughs> yes, it does. I just, I just went there like a month ago and I have a picture by the beaver. So <laughs> anyway, distracted me a little bit. All right. So there's our little getting to know um, some of our local authors here. I hope that helped. Um, just introducing because people out there may not know you at all. So now we're going to move into our sections where we're going to focus a little more on one author at a time and then we'll meet back all together in the end. So what I'm going to do for this and I'm thinking maybe because Eunice is going first, do Michelle and Vaughn want to maybe turn off their cameras so you're still here and you're listening but then I think that will allow the screen to focus on Eunice and myself just for this part. Okay. And I'm watching on the other side on Facebook to see if it's going to behave how I think it's going to. So it's a slightly delayed, but um, for Eunice, what we decided to do together here is that we are going to do a couple interview questions and we're also going to hear an excerpt from her book. Maybe you want to start off Eunice, by telling us about your books. What books okay. did you write? <laughs> <laughs> I have three of them. Beyond the Purple Sky is was ish, released in uh, June 2020. It's a biblical novel, and it's uh, about uh, life during the Babylonian captivity, and then coming out of Babylon into uh, Israel. And I think the easiest way to do it is just read the back blurb. Okay. Please be patient with me with my pieces of paper. I am blind. I can't read my own book, so I have to enlarge. <laughs> right. Follow his heart. Zerubbabel must deny his own people and his God. Zerubbabel grew up with strangers in a strange land. Someday, his Babylonian tutor told him, you'll be chief advisor to King Belshazzar. But Yahweh, the God of the Jews, had other plans for him. Plans that forbid him the love of his life. Plans that led him through a maze of political intrigue to survive a kingdom's collapse. Plans that stretched his wisdom and abilities until he questioned his own identity. Then he was commanded to leave the Jews out of Babylonia across an angry desert to the land of their forefathers, a land that had vomited out his ancestors because of their dis disobedience to Yahweh. And from that rubble left behind, a temple must rise. That's beyond the purple sky. There we go. Yeah, yeah I think I've read a book of sort of that same idea, like taking a biblical story and kind of putting it into um, a novel. <laughs> novel, I don't mean new, but, but like yeah. the format of a novel. And yeah. it, it just um, brings it to life a little bit more. 
Because sometimes yes. the biblical language is a little bit tricky to kind of yes. see what's all going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, the important right. thing is, is uh, keep to historical facts and mm -hmm. weave the story between the facts. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. The next one is um, behind her name. We've jumped many centuries in this one. This is uh, more modern day. And what really uh, got me to write this book was uh, the amount of bullying and abuse that's going on in our society nowadays. Okay, and I didn't uh, zero in on... <laughs> We're live, folks. <laughs> I didn't zero in on the abuse as it is. I wrote it to adults that are dealing with abuse from childhood and how it affects them in adulthood. Okay. And uh, my pro tag in here is a writer because that's what I'm uh, the life that I'm most used to. So, you know, we write what we know. <laughs> and the blurb on that one is pain and beatings, ebbing, pain from beatings, ebbing days but emotional abuse lingers for a lifetime. In a few short years, Sage Bush becomes a best-selling author. She's traveled the world and built a home she's dreamed of owning all her life. But in one moment at a book signing event, three teenagers unknowingly sent her world on a one-way collision course. Physical and emotional wounds from an abusive parent and bullying she'd suffered in school that she had safely hidden in a vault somewhere in her subconscious broke loose, threatening her life as she knew it until one of her worst teenage tormentors helped her find healing. Yeah, that is that one. <laughs> and my last I, I like the last line, her worst teenage tormentor helped her find healing. That makes me go, I want to know. Yeah. yeah I want to know. I want to know. And my last one, now uh, I'm jumping. This one, uh, Doubt in Eden, it was written for seniors, more so senior widows. And I have zeroed in on the seniors because being a senior looking for something to read about people my own age is very difficult to find. So I decided maybe I should help out the situation. There you and go. I wrote this one. Nice. Okay, and it's blurb is being 67 and a widow is a one way ticket to loneliness. Lorna Scott experienced this reality after her husband Randy passed. While he was alive, she'd been half of a couple and part of a closeness knit social unit. But as weeks became months, she had morphed into a fifth wheel. Friends no longer knew how to communicate with her, announcing her isolation. Then after an act of spontaneity, she thought she'd found love again, but her life transformed into a terrifying nightmare. <laughs> a terrifying nightmare. Okay, now that makes me want to do. Oh boy. I, I and that is the one I did the first pair, the first chapter up to read. Okay, and also I noticed on the cover of that one, I think it said, was it Sunset Series Book One? Yes, it's Book One in a Three Series Set. Okay, so okay. you've got some more writing to do, hey? Well, I've got it done. I've just got edit, 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 oh. re edit, re edit. This oh. one is um, Doubt in Eden. The next one is Return to Eden. And the third one is After the Storm Passes. Okay. Yeah. And why don't we go ahead and do your reading so we make sure we have time for that and then questions we'll just do whatever we've got time for all right I have there we go here we are we have to sort all these papers out That's right and again I'm reading from papers not the book sadness gripped Lorna Scott she stepped onto her 12th floor balcony and sank into a white wrought iron lounge chair for the last five years of their 40-year marriage oh my TV went funny. Is that okay? I'm still here. I'm just trying to let you have the big screen. Oh, okay. Shall I start over then? Sure. Sadness gripped Lorna Scott. She stepped onto the, 
her 12th floor balcony and sank into a white wrought iron lounge chair. For the last five years of their 40 year marriage, this condo had been her and Randy's home, but not anymore. Her husband resided in heaven. Everything looked the same, but all had changed. Yellow marigolds and snapdragons still, still flourished in Greek style urns and dark blue petunia still hung from planters anchored to the railing. A small table and chairs matching her lounge stood on the opposite side of the balcony. Her mini garden of Eden as Randy had called it. But today the memory did little to disclose the loneliness clicking, clinging to her like a tick clings to skin. She glanced from her spot beneath the awning to beyond the balcony railings. Rain poured down to her left, washing away dust on the street. Yet to her right, intense sunbeams warmed her bare arm. She snuggled deeper into the orange and white cushion. Only in Alberta, sun and showers hold hands. Ten min for 10 minutes, she mused on her and Randy's last trip to Scotland with her best friends, Marcy and Jack, then pushed herself out of the chair. Even without Randy, life waited for nothing, and her shift at the local mission began in an hour. Busyness greeted her when she arrived at the outreach mission. Jody moved along the, alongside the prep table, laying out slices of bread. She glanced up as Laura entered the kitchen. You're just in time. Can you start buttery? Will do. Laura washed her hands, then grabbed a clean apron from the shelf beneath the table. After she tied it around her waist, she took a knife from the drawer and started slathering butter. The aroma of simmering beef noodle soup made her mouth water. Without breaking her rhythm, she cast Betty a smile. Your soup smells delicious, as usual. Betty beamed and continued stirring the soup. It'll be ready soon, and I hope you'll have those sandwiches done by then. The kitchen door slammed. Startled, Lorna looked up. Marcy, Marcy rushed in and grabbed an apron. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare everyone. I'm running late. She opened the fridge and took out a five-pound package of bologna, a jar of mustard, and another of mayo. Jody glanced at Marcy. You haven't been here for a while, and we've missed you. Marcy's face brightened. Jack and I just returned from an African safari. Lorna's throat throbbed. Four years ago, she and Randy were Marcy and Jack's travel companions. She took a deep breath and released it. The pressure in her throat ebbed. She buttered the last slice of bread, then squeezed squiggly lines of mustard in every second slice. When she could trust herself to speak, she glanced at Marcy. I miss our trips. Jody opened the bologna and lay a slice on top of the mustard squiggles. It must have been strange for you going by yourself instead of with Lorna and Randy. Nice to see. It's <laughs> bad. Marcy flipped her dark brown, brown hair over her shoulders. We didn't, uh, we didn't go alone after... Another couple moved into our complex six months ago. It's amazing how much the four of us have in common. Anyway, to make a long story short, we went to Africa with them. Lorna's lips quivered. She bit hard to force them still. Without Randy, she'd, learn, she'd turned into a fifth wheel. She stepped behind Jody and keeping her head down, folded the loaded slices of bread into sandwiches, anything to keep busy. I'm sorry, Jody cut the sandwiches in half and placed them on a large metal tray. That must have hurt. It's okay, it is what it is. Marcy slid her, slid her arm across Lorna's shoulders. I'm so sorry. It wasn't as much fun as it was with you and Randy, the four of us who were a team. Lorna placed the last two sandwiches on the tray, but one of us isn't here anymore and a team can't function with a missing link. Even I understand that. She picked up the platter and headed for the hall. I'll put these on the serving table. Is the egg salad finished yet? Behind her, Marcy's voice cracked. I didn't mean to upset her. It came out before I thought. Lorna turned. Marcy, I understand, but it hurts. She turned to the auditorium. After setting the platter down, she grasped the edge of the table. Why did everyone walk in eggshells or constantly console her? It didn't help, but letting off steam did. The cafe door slammed and Betty waddled to the table carrying the first huge soup pot. 
Lorna stepped aside and pushed the mat so Betty could set the container on it. The older lady wiped the perspiration off her forehead with the corner of her apron. It gets better. Many times after my George passed, I wished I could have gone with him, but time dulls the edges. I've developed other friendships, not like my George, but friends who have a cup of when I need one, and that'll happen to you too. It just takes time. She patted Lorna's arm and hurried back to the kitchen. Lorna watched her go. That was so God. Only he would know what she needed to hear. She stacked styrofoam bowls beside the soup. Can someone bring the spoons and napkins? We have a lineup already. A few minutes later, Lorna stood alongside Betty watching clients file past the table, accepting soup and selecting sandwiches. The same hollow look resided in all her eyes. Some tried to smile and offer small talk, but others just looked down. The line thinned. Only a single layer of sandwiches remained on both platters, and Betty was leaning the soup pot to fill her label. A young woman, not much, not much more than a girl, stepped into the room and glanced around as if looking for somebody. Her gaze rested on the serving table and her brows furrowed before she approached. Betty handed her a bowl of soup and she accepted it and took two egg salad sandwiches. Now that's a sad case, Betty whispered after the girl shuffled away. Poor lass, she's scared to come but too hungry to stay away. I've seen many like her. She shook her head. All they need is a home and someone to love them. Lorna nodded. I know what you mean. The teenagers bother me. I can't imagine what put them on the street. They're barely beyond childhood. The girl sat, on an em sat at an empty table and scooped a spoonful of soup in her mouth. Do you know her? The furrows on Betty's forehead arched up almost to her, gray, her curly gray hairline. Yes and no. I don't know her personally, never been here before, at least not in my shift. But she's just like the others, lost and unloved. Lorna pretended to look at something on the wall above where the girl sat and studied her. Long black hair, straggly in need of washing. High cheekbones, but delicate, beautiful, large brown eyes. The girl looked in Lorna's direction and her face reddened. She drank her remaining soup, grabbed her sandwiches and ran for the door. Betty shot Lorna a disgruntled look. You know better than stare at the clients. It embarrasses them and makes them feel lower than they already do. Lorna's cheeks burned. She did know better, yet there was something about the girl that grabbed her attention. She stacked the remaining sandwiches on the smaller tray and returned the larger one to the kitchen. That evening, Laura leaned leaned back in her recliner, unable to erase the young lady's face from her mind. She ran her fingers through her hair, forcing the short spikes to stand taller, but restlessness remained. She needed to run. It put her thoughts in order and dispersed confusion. Clad in a black jersey exercise suit, she hit the trail that wandered around the pond in the center of her complex, then made its way into the river valley. By the time she passed the manicured lawns and entered the untamed forest hugging the North Saskatchewan River, the day's pressures lessened. She breathed in the earthy aroma of spruce and rotting vegetation. As the trail narrowed, twigs and needles snagged at her hair, giving her, her a mini head massage as she plowed forward. The evergreens gave way to poplar and shrubs, enabling Lorna to pick up more speed. Her breast strained and her parched throat hurt, but she pushed on. She reached a bench alongside of the tra dirt trail and collapsed onto it. Leaning her head back, she sucked in deep breaths. Once her heart rate and breathing normalized, she took several long pulls from her water bottle she attached to her belt. Relief was instant. She glanced at her watch, 9.15. As if to confirm the time, a chilly breeze rustled leaves on giant trees. Lorna shivered, then hurried down the trail. When she rounded the corner that started her homeward jaunt, the trail was vacant. She quickened her gait. How could she have lost track of time? Since Randy's death, awareness of her surroundings were a part of life. An hour later, she emerged from her bathroom, snuggled in her favorite robe and a towel wrapped around her wet hair. Her computer pinged, announcing a new email, and she crossed the hall to the den. Only four messages. The last one caught her attention. Big white letters popped off a bright blue background. Are you tired of being alone? 
we understand. I'm sure you do. Lorna moved her cursor to the delete icon, but before she clicked, the website name, the website name stopped her, the Christian meeting spot. She scrolled through the site and her throat and her throat stiffened. It said Christian, so it shouldn't hurt to browse. Before she could talk herself out of it, she clicked on the learn more icon. A registration appeared. Lorna leaned back in her chair. Horror stories of online dating sites were old news. Exploitation ruled these communities. But this one didn't say dating, it said meeting, and a friend is what she needed right now. She tapped the left, left side of her mouse. Rationality screamed, get out. Christian made her hesitate. Loneliness reached for the mouse. When she finished the registration, she clicked join. Excitement swept through her. Then what have I done? Wiped it away. But she had done nothing except tire of being alone. There's a go. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> Wow. So I was thinking as I'm listing, that's um, it's very relatable type of writing because anybody who has, you know, lost somebody and then you find yourself in social situations or so on and somebody says something and they don't mean to be insensitive or anything and, and they aren't really, but it just triggers, you know, things yeah. and in you and and the end of the chapter there, a feeling of loneliness and and you've got to do something. And yeah, so <laughs> I found your writing very relatable and you. as you're reading it. <laughs> okay. The Thank phone you. going off. <laughs> oh yeah, the phone going, yeah, that's relatable too. <laughs> I can tell you that's happened to me. Uh, all right. Um, so just taking a peek here at, at some of the questions, are you okay with if I could go in whatever order I want, or do you want? It's things? okay. I I have I wrote okay. down what I wrote what I, what I answered them on paper. <laughs> okay. So the the first one I wanted to ask you um, was what was your hardest scene to write as you were reading that book? Right, that someone yes. is going through difficult times and and so on. Okay. Um, it might surprise you. The hardest one uh, to write was um, Beyond the Purple Sky, the chapter of the chariot races. Because oh. you have to keep the chariot races authentic and uh, show off the personality of Zerubbabel and uh, Belshazzar. And at the same time, there's four other very high profile pictures that you people in that scene that I had to be honest with as well. So it was just balancing all of this and yet keeping the excitement, keeping the tragedy and all, you know, I found it very difficult and probably months to write that one chapter. Oh, wow. Because I was thinking if this question would be more like emotionally what would be difficult but this is technical right like what's <laughs> technically difficult in writing but that's a great way to answer that question thank you um now this is in uh an interesting one too do you read your book reviews yeah well i don't go out to read them but if i'm on goodreads or on amazon and i see that uh, one has popped up i will read it and if it's a good one, I will smile. If it's a, <laughs> if it's a bad one, I will reread it and then uh, listen to what that person is saying and determine what is behind what he is saying. Because mm. sometimes uh, what they're saying is for real. And I would do good to pay attention to what they're saying. In fact, I kind of think of reviews like uh, Simon Cowell you know what, he can be quite abrupt, he can be quite rude at times, but he knows what he's talking about. That's and I really look at book reviews that same way. Mm -hmm. And I like, I think you said, you try and think where they're coming from, yeah. right? Because people can have different motivations for the things that's that right. they're saying, the, That's right? the discernment. And it always comes out in what they say. You can, if you reread it a couple of times, you will discern where their thoughts are coming from. Right. And then um, 
So this one, then, as you're reading the review, you are listening to what the individuals have to say. This question kind of ties to that. Do you try to be original or to deliver to readers what they want? Hmm. I am who I am. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. We all are. <laughs> I have my thoughts. I will pick my genre or situation, and I will express my own thoughts and my own feelings through my POVs or my point of views. Right. And then if people have comments on it, then you kind of yeah. think about what they have to say, but you're still you and you're not I'm just still to, me. I cannot try to but be anybody but me. Or it'll yeah. sound phony. That's right. So does writing energize you or exhaust you? Taking a month to write that chapter might have been <laughs> exhausting, but um both. Um let me see. I wrote this down somewhere. Yeah, it does both depending on, uh, you know. Um, okay, I've lost it. Oh. <laughs> you might have to rely on your brain. Uh -oh. I know, but you know, the old brain is starting to fry. And yeah, I, and you, you had something good written down, hey? Well, yeah. I tried it's to close to the beginning. It's the third question on the... Okay, that well, list. that helps at all. That should be easy. We'll just find the... Okay, now I'm getting embarrassed. Oh, don't worry. It's okay. For the people at home, I gave some options of questions that they could choose from. So Eunice prepared. And she's just oh, trying yeah. to find what she prepared. Oh, there it is. She lost the page. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah what I wrote. It does both. When I get into a scene that flows, it's like canoeing on a backcountry lake. But there are many scenes that are like extracting a tooth with no freezing. There are many times I spent an entire day on one paragraph because I know what I want to do, but no matter how many times I rewrite, it won't, won't sing. Sometimes I need to trash the whole thing and come at it from a different angle. I can write better than I can talk. <laughs> oh, I hear you, though. I'm just thinking about sometimes it's me and technology fights. Um, and it's like, I know what I want the thing to do, but sometimes I got to walk away, right? And then come That's back right. and go yeah. again. It's just nothing's working. So, yeah. Um, and how about this one? What does literary success look like to you? Contentment in what I'm doing. The uh, ability to write, the ability to um, minister or um, give pleasure to somebody else. Okay, so it's not for you about how many books you can get done or sell or. No, like it's uh, like writing a good story. Just being Nothing. able to use that skill. Yeah. 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 All right. That's it's not great. that I have to write to, or starve. That might be a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's give one or two more a go. Our time is uh, running out a little. Was there any questions that you're really hoping I would ask off the list? Mm, no. Okay. Yeah, maybe there's um, one uh, that I kind of found fun answering. Okay. The, um, what is your earliest experience where you learned that language has power? Mm, yes. Okay. In grade school, although I read a lot, it was for entertainment. In high school, I delved deeper into stories. Thomas B. Costain and Lloyd C. Douglas were my favorite. And it was reading their work that I actually took note of their execution of words and how strategically strategically they chose them images and emotions of the words they images and emotions of their words evoked in me 60 years ago are still as vivid as they were then edward rutherford and collie mccullough and francine rivers are more modern writers that delight me the same way yeah so what can you tell us a little bit more about like those images that stuck with you from, did you, how old did you say you were when that happened? Well, I would or, say when I started go reading Thomas B. Costain, 
and Lord T. Douglas, I was about 13. Okay. You know, and these were very deep, uh, you know, historical. I love historical fiction. Okay. And um, Thomas B. Costain, he spans quite a few years. You know, uh, Lloyd C. Douglas is biblical novels, but Thomas B. Costain writes about the French Revolution. He will go into the Scandinavian countries and write about the revolutions then. But there was images in there, like uh, in the dungeons, I tell for you, I still think thinking of that. And, you know, the treatment that people that stood up against the government uh, in Scandinavia, yeah, it, I can still see those pictures it evoked. And then there's one that I talk about it in uh, Behind Her Name, that um, it was Son of a Hundred Kings was the name of the book. And the book started out with this little orphan boy sitting in a chair in his lawyer's office and noting how his feet stuck out in front of him and what he was thinking, wondering where he was going to go. Like the words are just so... You know, it paints a picture with no paintbrush. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and those kind of writings, I just, oh, give me more, give me more. Yes, yes, there you go. All right. Well, I think, well, we're out of time, but there's so many questions we could have asked and talked <laughs> about, but it probably was a little bit of a fun experience thinking through some of those questions too and how you might answer them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Eunice, for sharing um, a little bit from your book with us. And I'll say this now, I guess, so I don't forget to say it later, but this applies for all three authors that we have featured here, that we are going to have a few copies of their books available at the library for purchase. So if you want to get a copy now, I think most of these books are also usually available on Amazon, but if you don't want to wait, <laughs> you can just go to the library and get your book. Um, and also uh, their books are available through the library system. So if purchasing a book is not, you know, um, in your budget or so on, or you just want to give it a try, you can always take the book out from the library with your library card. Okay, so any last words you wanted to, last words, that sounds so good. <laughs> Final, we will meet oh together God, at the end, but anything else left. you want to share while you have the spotlight? <laughs> no, except to say thank you for doing this. Oh, I appreciate it. And thank you for coming. And I hope that some more people will discover your books and the books of other local authors. Thank All right. You. Perfect, Eunice. So Eunice, if you want to turn off your camera, but you can still hang out. And then we're going to get Michelle next to turn her camera on. And it will be her turn to be featured. All right, here we go. We'll just give it a minute. Oh, Vaughn is clapping for you, Eunice. I don't know if you can Thank see, you. but he put his virtual hand. Oh, Michelle gives us real hands. Thank you. <laughs> All right, oh, can you find your, oh. I'm sorry. I didn't practice. Oh, guess what? I might have the power to help you. Shall Stop I help you? Video. That's the one. You got it. Okay. <laughs> there we I are. learned something. Yay, and we can always learn new things, hey? All right, so Michelle, would you like to share with us? Now we heard from Eunice, and it looks like Eunice is mostly writing novels, but I don't know if that's your writing style. You want to share with us a little bit about your writing? Uh, yes, it was, uh, I usually say it's a book of poems so people can relate, but more, more so it's messages. So it didn't start out as, oh, I want to write a book. It started out as I was receiving intu intuitively messages from spirit. And I began writing them down. And I realized this could be a book. So that's where how that came about. So they're really messages. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I hope they bring comfort to people. That was my intention. You know, what? Uh, how can I comfort? How can I help? And then that's how the messages started, so. And I think, like, there's photography in your book as well. Did you take pictures? I took uh, probably about half of them. Uh, the other half, the pictures didn't turn out quite as well, like, printable in a book. 
because they, they were just not good quality. So I ended up uh, going to a free site, a legitimate free site and borrowing oh. some pictures. Oh. And I'm curious, you have the book there. Oh, show us what it's called. Tell us what it's called, because I don't think we did that. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. it's, <laughs> it's okay. It's called uh, Breaths of the Heart. Yeah. And that's what it looks like. And I was going to ask, too, can you show us any of the pictures? I'm especially curious about the ones you took. <laughs> yeah, let's take a look here. So uh, quite a bit of few of them are in nature. So here's one of them. I don't know if it'll turn out very well on the camera. We get the idea of it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sun shining on the dew and the wetness on the leaves on that and particular it, picture. Is it just like in your yard or were you out walking or where do you find your pictures often? Uh, it's often in... Uh, uh, not necessarily by my home, but out in nature, by, uh, by a pond. Um, I think there's two pictures of my grandson in there. Um, <laughs> pictures of uh, the geese, because I enjoyed watching the geese mm -hmm. and how they just communicated with each other on the pond, even without saying a word. For instance, last year there was three families of geese and they all got in the water, swam, and they all left without saying a word. Like they intuitively knew each other, what they were doing. It was, I thought it was remarkable. Simple, but remarkable. That's beautiful. The time I spent a little bit by some birds this summer was feeding some ducks in the pond and they were not all getting along. <laughs> Light over the food, but but there are those. Well, that was humans interfering with nature, so maybe we just left them alone. They'd be a little nicer to each other. But yes, there are those those wonderful moments. So it's just kind of what inspires you as whatever is beautiful that you're seeing as you're out and about. Now we've all got our phones, yeah. and how we can snap a, a picture any any time, pretty much. So yeah. yeah. And I think were you going to read us a poem or two? Or yeah, you bet. All right. This one is called The Strength of a Woman. The strength of a woman isn't the muscles in her body. It's measured in her heart. Often her heart is massive as it holds the love of family, children, a community. What she has been through has prepared her and made her who she is. They say love is stronger than hate, I believe. This is a woman's soft voice and touch, reaching out and touching many. And did you want to show us the picture that goes with it too? Oh, sure. So it's uh, another nature picture. There you go. Yeah. And did you get to, in the um, editing publishing process, get to decide which pictures went with which poems? Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, you bet. And the second poem I had picked out is uh, New Moon. What does it mean for you? Newness is what it means for me. New thoughts, new energy, cleansing energy. This can be felt after a deep breath, a walk in nature, or sm someone smiles. Let's embrace the newness. And then this is just a, a moon. <laughs> and oh, so did you want I'll, just I'll just read one more. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's called My Greatest Teacher. My greatest teacher holds no grudges. He lives minute to minute, day to day. My Greatest teacher doesn't take life too seriously. He loves to have fun, no matter the circumstance. He shows me you don't need much, and worry doesn't do anyone any good. My greatest teacher is three feet tall, with a heart bigger than anyone I've seen. He'll light up any darkness, 
and leave a trail of love so precious you'll never forget. Aww. <laughs> so so that, is that your grandson then you were mentioning there's pictures of him? Exactly, yeah. So my daughter took a video of him throwing leaves. So I was out, out, able to capture a scene and turn it black and white. And I thought, oh, I love it. Got to put it in. <laughs> yeah, I love like that you're, you're saying that a young person can be your greatest teacher because I think, you know, as we get older, we get a little more jaded about mm -hmm. things and then they're just um, not entirely pure spirits, but you know what I mean? They're not there yet and they have that joy and that enthusiasm for life. And if you can just allow that to infiltrate your own life. I had a moment I got to play with a, a young child outside not too long ago just using imagination and that was like oh I haven't played in so long and it felt so good <laughs> right yeah so. I find uh, kids they can easily just be here right now in this space just playing whereas us as, as adults uh, speaking for myself I'm worrying about the future and what happened in the past and it's just right here that's important yeah yeah and, and the thing um, they talk about a catchphrase these days, I guess, is mindfulness kind of, and that's what that is, is like trying to just be there in that moment and not being pulled this way and that and everything and just, and kids are great teachers of that. They so, sure are. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you've um, written this one book. Are you planning to write any more? This is just a one-time thing or... Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, this was completely intuitive. So um, if I get the pull, so to speak, to do it again, I certainly will. I also paint occasionally and I also teach meditation and I'm a Reiki master. So a little bit of buckets everywhere. So and I believe you have a website too that features some of those paintings and things. Yes, Breaths of the Heart is what it's called. Okay, Please so out. if people want to find more about those aspects of your life, they can head to that website. You bet. Okay, all right. Well, we've got a few questions here too. So uh, let's give this a go. I found it interesting, actually. I mentioned to Eunice the other day that some of those questions that you guys picked were the same. <laughs> so oh. it was like, oh, these are popular ones. Um, so there's one that was the same that I'm going to ask for sure. So does writing energize or exhaust you? I would say it uh, energizes me because uh, when I did write, spirit was flowing through me and that's always a positive thing. So it would energize me for sure. I'd feel really good afterwards. Yeah, and it might be, well, I shouldn't say this exactly, but uh, Sometimes maybe writing a poem versus writing a novel, it can be a different level of challenge. Although poems, you can be trying to get very particular in those too, right? So there, there could be a level of challenge there too. And like the writing uh, Eunice does, that sounds like a lot of work and it was beautiful. Hmm. Um, but for, it sounds like for you, the, the writing that you did, it was kind of just flowing and coming as Correct. you did it. Yeah, a little smoother process. Okay. Um, and I think I could probably answer this question for you just from having her, but I'm going to ask you anyways, do you try to be original or to deliver to readers what they want? I kind okay. of think I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> yeah, I kind of uh, like Wayne Dyer used to say, let go and let God. So I just let go and whatever I'm being led to, so to speak, and um, let the, the chips fall where they may. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, um, let's see which one I should do. Now, this one's interesting. You picked it, but in your book, um, I don't, well, I guess, were some of your poems based on real people or? Uh, grandson, yeah. And oh. one poem was about uh, a cat who's passed. So living okay. things. 
So, so you might uh, replace the words real people and real living things in yeah. this question, right? Family yeah, members. <laughs> yeah. What do you owe the real living things upon whom you base, in this case, it's like characters, but base your poems, I guess it would be. So what do you owe them? It's, it's asking. I think I owe them my respect and love for sharing me their their life, you know, even a uh, cat is just an animal he can still love and share space with you and um, they intuitively know when you're not feeling well and they'll come over and so yeah I owe them love and respect. Yeah, And I'm with you about the cat thing. <laughs> yeah, they can definitely if you're having a rough day to you know share that love and it makes a difference that's for sure. Um, just what I'm going to ask, what was your favorite childhood book? Oh, gosh, I didn't write it down. Yeah. <laughs> Do you I, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the title, but yeah, it's over on the bookshelf there. And I would read it over and over again. It's, uh, oh, God, look at me with my memory. <laughs> you can tell us what it's about don't worry at the library we get people come in they don't know the title can you find us the book that's about this and this and that <laughs> so we're used to that over here yeah it's, it's, about? it's about a little girl that uh, goes over to her grandparents and she wishes she wasn't the only one so she talks to the chickens you know oh mrs hen i wish i had someone to play with and the uh, the hen would say, oh, go play with the other little girls in your family. Well, I'm the only one. And she would go through there for the hen and then through the dog family and through the cat family. And then at the end of the book, uh, the, the grandmother said, oh, I got a surprise for you. Let's go back home. And, and there was a new baby, <laughs> a baby oh. brother. <laughs> That's cute. Now, yeah. were you a single child? Did you have siblings? No, as the youngest of five. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you never had the chance to, maybe you wished sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> maybe what I, you... Yeah, maybe I liked it because of the connection between the girl talking to the animals, maybe. I don't know. You don't know, but it just appealed to you. So having uh, talked about childhood, then did you do any writing prior to this book um like just journaling. journaling yeah journaling. just journaling mm -hmm. all right well, that's good practice for sure <laughs> <laughs> and likely though it is that other people probably didn't uh, get to read any of your journals right yeah mm -hmm. so this is kind of the first thing that other people are getting to read of your writing then that's so, correct yeah mm -hmm. And was that um, scary at all? <laughs> or uh, maybe going through the process of, you know, having someone edit it and, and put it together, because it was all so new to me. I think that process was a little scary, but the rest, I was just led, if that makes any sense. So yeah, it just... was smooth. Yeah, excited to actually get to share those yeah. thoughts and, and that writing. But yeah, the whole, oh, people are going to come and nitpick on <laughs> what I did now and <laughs> how will that go? <laughs> yeah, that's the scary part. Eh? Okay. Um, let's see. So this one is said, um, if you had to do something differently as a child or teenager to become a better writer as an adult, what would you do? I think I would just worry less, just, you know, to, uh, about the conversation about the grandson, you know, just realize that we're going to get through life, whether we worry or we don't. So let's just stop worrying and start living. Yeah. That's what I wish I would have done more is just flow more, I guess. Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of conversation about that the other day in terms of um, you can decide your attitude for life and that's going to affect your experience, right? So if you decide 
this isn't fun. I'm not, you know, enjoying this, then that's how it's going to be. <laughs> right. But right. if you decide, Hey, this could be good. Oh, let's give it a try. Maybe I'll have some fun. That's probably what's going to happen. So, so true. Yeah. Our intention. Mm -hmm. We have a choice about that. Okay. And let's see here. We already did that. Um, do you think someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotions strongly? I think they could. Yeah, I, I think anyone could probably write. It all starts like by journaling or, or maybe just telling a story, but maybe there's no emotional connection. But that's just my thought, but maybe... Probably Eunice could probably answer that better than I, but that's what I think. <laughs> Do you think, um, like for you, for writing, was it strong emotionally? Could you write not emotionally? How were emotions mm. involved in your writing? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was emotionally. Uh, yeah, I couldn't write this without first you know, grounding and allowing and knowing when to write, you know, because usually a, a good feeling would arise and, I, and I'd know to grab the pen and paper and get ready because I knew something was coming. And that's a very good emotion. So, yeah, I don't think I could write without emotion in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, and as a writer, this is an interesting one. As a writer, what would you choose as your mascot or avatar? So if you had to represent yourself as a writer, and I guess it's talking animal mostly, what animal would you? That's a hard question, right? You got to yeah. think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, some kind of bird perhaps it's flowing like an eagle and just going through the sky and yeah just flowing let the wind go underneath the wings and free yeah i think from um the answers that we've gotten to your questions and so on we can kind of tell quite a bit about your style of writing then like it's, it's relaxed it's flowing it's um and you said earlier it's for encouragement of others to lift them up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So as I asked Eunice before, do you have any last words? <laughs> <Not to be laughs> final, but no. Was there anything else that you hope to share or any questions I didn't get to that you hope to answer or anything like that, that we missed? Uh, that's okay with the uh, questions. Just wanted to say thank you for putting this on and getting us together. Yes, I, I did get to take a sneak peek at your book before it, it went away to get uh, processed, I was saying, so that the library can check it out, and it was looking pretty good. So I'm excited for when it becomes more available. And as I mentioned uh, with Eunice's book, Michelle, I believe you're going to bring a couple copies down to the library as well, so folks can pick those up if they would like to. Yeah, you All can. right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm like, Vaughn, are you going to put any clapping hands up there for Michelle? I feel left out. No pressure. <laughs> no, oh, there's the clapping hands. I see them. Thank you, Vaughn. Oh, yeah, the folks that, oh, you got a thumbs up also. Wow, he's right in there. Okay. <laughs> so, well, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, she's turning off her camera. That's perfect. And then we'll ask Vaughn if he can turn his camera back on. There we go. So it should show the two of us here pretty soon. All right. And now we're on our third writer here. The first question I'd have for you, Vaughn, though, um, we've got the one book out, but I know that this book, and I know for all the authors too, the book isn't the only part of their life. <laughs> but um, do you view yourself as an author? Like, would you call yourself? I know you are an author, but like how much of your identity, <laughs> I guess I'm asking that's a good question, actually. I view myself, of course, as a writer because I'm a member of uh, what you call this when I was school paper way back when I was still in university. Okay. So I write. I also write something like journaling. 
But my very first work last year, which is this book, this is my first project. And this made me official published author. But I view myself more of a facilitator and speaker. Mm -hmm. I wrote the book. It's because that's actually from my experience when I'm teaching the youth, youth leadership program, one in the library. Thank you for that, Erna. And then three from our Holy Trinity Academy here. So three youth leadership programs. So that gives me inspiration actually to uh, write it in the book. And another thing that inspires me to do this project, it's because I'm doing a book donation program in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I donated some like 700 books. So I told myself, if I'm gathering books from authors, so probably Michelle and Eunice, if they want to donate their book in the future when we are no longer in this situation that we are in. Right. If I'm gathering and asking for friends' book, why not make my own? So that that's the book that go. going to, uh, what do you call this one, uh, donate in the Philippines. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I still consider myself as a writer and author, but I view myself more of a speaker okay. and facilitator. I'm just doing something really quickly here technologically um, because I see it's a little bit hard for folks to see the cover of your book there, but I have a way I can show it to them. So one second here, I'm just gonna share my screen. I've got a picture of it. Okay, so hopefully people can see that there. So this is Vaughn's book. Say it loud, say it proud. Making an impact, discover the keys to speaking confidently. Yeah, All thank right. you. You're welcome. Just give the people a good view there and then we'll come on back. All right. So now Vaughn, I think that you had a presentation that you wanted to share with us. Yes, okay. I would like to guide everyone with this first chapter of this book. This is nine chapter, and I have a slide presentation, and I'm going to share it. There you go. Let's have it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, where are you? Okay. Cross my fingers that it's all. <laughs> gonna work okay for us let's have it hopefully i can't find my canva right now oops i'm sharing my email i believe oh don't share the email with the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right um, you make me a sharer yes. oh you were successfully sharing so, okay. but yeah, so I, uh, um, but you just need to get your presentation opened first, I think, and then you can select that to share. We didn't practice this part at home, guys. Uh, sorry, we didn't practice for this lot. <laughs> Not to worry, I was doing the from home concert the other day too and having a little trouble with my share screen. Yeah. How it goes sometimes. Okay, so you can ask me a question while... While you're working on that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I am going to do the same question, one of them that I asked other, the other authors as well, which is, does writing energize or exhaust you? Well, it, I can say both of them. It energizes me if there's a result. And that's normal, right? It also, it hosts, uh, it's, it's hosting if we all know writers, maybe not everyone, but this is the common to writers, the writer's block. So yeah. I noticed myself in four hours I'm writing last year and there's no idea coming in. So that is hosting, right? Four hours and you can even compose or create one sentence. So that is exhausting, but overall it's rewarding. So when there's a reward, then that's enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. Would you say then, Vaughn, that you're a goal-orientated person? Like, 
you like you, you work on something you want to see the results and that gives you satisfaction yes i am a goal oriented person so if yeah. i say i'll finish this something in 90 days i'll do it so if i say yes. i'll put up my website in three months i should do it so yes. the last four months so for three months my goal right now is to start a second book so in three months i should have the chapters i should have the title i should have and then probably ready to go next year mm, there's no definite month next year but my last three months i want to plan prepare the, my second book and what what will the content of your second book be similar well, to the first uh, if Michelle has the collection of poems, it's about poem. mine is my collection of quotes and sayings. Oh, and okay. then I'll impart my experiences and stories in each saying or statement or something oh. like that. Yeah, so that's my plan. Yeah, that sounds interesting because I know you like to um, share, especially on Facebook and so on, lots of sayings that are encouraging and so on. Yes. Other people. <laughs> So this I is another it. way to, yeah. to share. Okay. Uh, am I sharing my... Uh, it didn't come up yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me give it another try, maybe. Yeah, okay. Whatever you did when you were trying to show your email, <laughs> it was good, except for it was email, not your um, presentation. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. All right. I'll see if I can find another question. Well, we how about that one? Did you see something? <laughs> no. No, not yet. Yeah. This morning I presented in Croatia, and it's really easy <laughs> for some reason right now. Over here, it's ordinary. Now, did you by any chance happen to make it full screen? Because yesterday I had trouble when I made it full screen; it wouldn't share, and I had to take oh. off. The full screen and try sharing it. I didn't know that before. How about that? No, mm -hmm. not yet. No luck. Nope, not no luck. Um, so I'll find us another question. Yeah, sure. Uh, for you, what does literary success look like for you? Well, success for everyone is unique and different. If I'm going to ask or we're going to ask everyone, we might have different answers about success. That's right. For some success is about money in the bank, beautiful cars, uh, big houses. But for me, success is where I'm very happy of what I have. Right? Being grateful. Once I'm happy, because there's a lot of successful people, but they're not happy, to That's be right. honest. Yeah, so right now, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Uh, I feel fulfilled last year when I finished this project, the book. And then I got my highest norm in Toastmaster International. I'm very, very proud of myself last year. And because of that, it gives me happiness. And the moment that I feel that happiness, I feel successful last year. So for me, being happy is the key to success and not the other way around. That's for me. So. Yeah. And the happiness is coming from contentedness yes. in where you are in life right now. Yes, yeah. Right. And so any other types of, of good things like Toastmasters going well and so on, this is like icing on the cake, like extra bonus happiness. <laughs> so right now, the happiness is I get to the chance to share my voice, my inspiration, I got to speak to different parts of the world, in and out of Toastmaster International. So actually, this is my, I think this is my fourth webinar and presentation <laughs> to just today. Oh so, my goodness, yeah. you're a busy so, man. <laughs> I started 3.30 in the morning, actually. Oh, wow, because so, that was overseas, right? That's overseas so. in Europe. And then I went to Pakistan. And then where should I? The last one is always the local, right? Global first, and then you will go back oh, to yeah. the, the local. So this is it. This is yeah, we were all in bed when you were doing that. That's why the last one's the local one. But <laughs> now for myself, I've been curious a little bit about 
um, your involvement with Toastmasters and everything. Like, how did this begin? I was, I was just talking with someone the other day, and sometimes you think uh, someone in Toastmasters or something like that is maybe a very confident person, but then I was thinking maybe this often starts with someone who's lacking in confidence, and so they join something to gain confidence. Uh-huh. So, so how did this work for, me, for you? And I'm kind of wondering, even as a, as a child, as a young person, have you always had this confidence? Is this something that um, you worked on and built on? Uh, confidence is within us, just like happiness. It starts inside. Mm-hmm. Right? So it doesn't involve, of course, the learning, the constant practice, that makes you confident. But overall, confidence comes within being a Toastmaster is an uh, accident for me. As I think six years ago, I went to this building wherein we still have our the campus here, like the, what do you call that campus? The Nate or something? We have that campus here before. Oh, the campus, like the yeah. little post-secondary campus. Yeah, yeah. I know. So I went there because I really wanted to upgrade. I'm really passionate of um, self-growth and development. I love learning. So anyway, I went to this campus uh, in, here in Drayton Valley. And then the moment I'm entering the door, I noticed this poster and it says there, you wanna gain confidence, you wanna ace that interview, you wanna improve your English skill. Of course, the answer is yes. And it says there, Toastmaster. And I don't know what is Toastmaster about. So in short, I did not be- become a student, but I became Toastmaster. And I think that is the best decision I made five or six years ago because it gives me the confidence. It made me a person what I am right now. I became a writer. I was able to can, uh, inspire people and I was able to present public speaking and communication to a group of uh, young adults. And also that made me an author. So actually, the book is all about communication, public speaking, and confidence building. So yeah, uh, it was just an accident for me to become a Toastmaster. I don't know all about it. I'm just passionate about learning. So I'm like a bird, as what Michelle said. Just go with the flow, just like Wayne Dyer said. I'm a big fan of Wayne Dyer, actually. I, I read his books. So yeah, just go with the flow. And that leads me. It's not one. Yeah. So. <laughs> so when you saw that poster, um, that you say confidence comes from within and, and all of that. So were, were you already feeling a fairly good level of confidence or would you call yourself a shy person prior to being coming involved with Toastmasters? Well, you- my shyness just depends on sometimes on my surroundings. If I have, I'm with my fellow immigrants. I'm not that shy. But to be honest, if I'm with a native English speaker before, because I'm new here, right? So I'm shy. So it depends on the mood. My shyness dep- depends on the surroundings. I'm shy one, maybe at one point of the day, I'm very shy. And then maybe at one point of the day, I'm not. But the confidence is also there. I or uh, I accept myself. To be confident is you need to accept yourself. Right? The moment that you don't accept yourself, then there's the uh, lack of confidence issue. That's a good. That's a good point. Because if you're having <clears throat> doubts about yourself, that's that's where that's lack of confidence, right? But yeah, yeah, and and it's a good point about being shy. That. I've, I've seen this even in children, you know, you meet them in one circumstance, they appear to be a shy child, and then you meet them when they're around their family or something, and you're like, oh, you're not shy. <laughs> so it's very true, our circumstances can uh, affect our, our, our portrayal of our confidence, <laughs> our sharing of our confidence. Sometimes yeah. we keep that in a little more, <laughs> right, depending on our circumstances. Do you think we're going to have any luck with your presentation there? Or I am not actually having a luck here for some. Oh, I see something. Okay. But this I don't is, know. 
it says Zoom now. So maybe is it a different tab up top there? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, it's happening, Bob. <laughs> Did you see the say it loud, say it proud? Yes. Right there? Is that one? Yeah. Okay, so say it loud, there. say it proud. So finally, this is success, right? Yes. One, <laughs> one important aspect of being confident is your calm. You're calm inside because if you start to panic, then there you go. <laughs> Okay, Say It Loud, Say It Proud is the title of my book. I call this my pandemic project because last year, almost everything, not all, stops. I got no work, so I got the chance to write a book. So the first part of my book is about communication. And I love saying this to everyone. Communication is not what you said. It is what the audience thinks you said. So let's say you're saying a donut or pizza, but the listener or the receiver understand it like chocolate, then there's a problem in communication. We all know that communication is sharing of ideas and information. And communication takes two, the sender and receiver, more than one person. If, ju if you're just by yourself, I don't think that's a communication. We call it probably a monologue, but that's different topic. So that is communication for me. It's not what you said. It is what the audience think of what you said. Chapter two of my book is about organization. So what is all about? So you have to do an outline, outline of your speech. And... The moment you are writing your speech and the moment that you will speak in the stage or virtual, you need to capture the audience. How do you capture the audience? You need to develop the opening lines. And then eventually, you will lead your audience to the body of your message. And you transition to closing. We call it the conclusion. So there are three basic components of a speech, actually. Number one is the opening, and you need to capture the audience immediately. Number two is your body, wherein that's your message. And the last one is transition to closing, which is the conclusion. So that is the organization part of my book. The third part, and this is important, too, in communication. Communication is not only about words. The no words, and I would love to call this as our body speaks too. So that eye contact, your facial expression, and you need to move on purpose and specific gestures. When you go out and speak, be it in person or virtual stage, you need to own the stage. What does it mean by own the stage? That is one word confidence. And yes, I would like to share this one. 93% is the numberable cues of communication. 38% and 55%. That 38% and 55% is the voice and the other is the body language. That means in communication, only 7% is our words. That is one chapter of the book. The next chapter chapter is filler words. We all know what is filler words, right? Um, yeah, so, you, you know, like, so that's a sample of filler words. And the most, uh, most of us are using filler words because we are thinking what we're going to say next. To be able to eliminate filler words, use the power of pause, right? It's better to have a pause than a hundred filler words. Sometimes it's annoying. The question here is, filler words bad? Yes, if it's too much. There are some motivational speaker, famous motivational speaker, Simon Sinek, when I hear their videos, I watch their videos, they have filler words, but they're not annoying because it's annoying, let's say, in 120 words that you're going to say, they're like about 20. 10 or more, so that's annoying, that's bad. So 
mostly those non-native speaker of English, like the Asians. They use filler words lot because they have to translate what they're going to say. So just like me, English is my fourth language. When I speak in language, I need to think first in my native tongue, and then I have to translate it to English. And that gives us filler words. And for non-native English speaker, of course, you have to use the power of pause so that you will go into eliminate the filler words like um, yeah, you know, like, ah. Uh. So that's one chapter in my book. Ideas. What I mean by ideas, you may have the best idea in the world, but if you don't have the continent to translate it into words, into speech, then that idea will remain an idea. So how do you develop your idea? We will go back to the second chapter, which is the organization, and you have to outline your speech. And that is the three components the opening, the body, and conclusion. So convert those ideas into action. That's another chapter. In moving to the next chapter, which is very important when you speak, is the diversifying of vocals. The volume, it refers to the loudness. Your pitch, is it high or too low? And how fast or how slow you speak? That is what we call rate. Lastly is the quality. Are you confident in speaking? Are you natural in speaking? Diversifying vocals involve rehearsal. So that's very important, the importance of rehearsal. In this book, actually, in the chapter of my book, I have presented some, what you call this one, uh, exercises, vocal exercises, so that uh, the volume, your pitch, and your rate and the quality of your voice will be improved. It's just a matter of rehearsal. Next one is, of course, evaluations. And this is what important. I remember the answer of Eunice when that she read the evaluations or the feedback, in a, and she said she's happy if they, she reads something nice, right? But if she reads something she, she wants she reads it all over again and you will learn because I always believe the evaluations, the feedback, you will learn from that. As a writer, author, we need actually evaluation. Same thing with the speaker. You need a feedback. So the audience actually are the number one people who will give you a feedback. Also your mentor or your coach. And as a speaker, we are actually evaluated how we look, how we sound, and how you organize your material. So that's the importance of evaluations. That so-called review, let's say in Amazon, you have that good review. Yeah. And of course, when you want to build the confidence, you have to practice, right? That leads you to your confidence. If you know what you're doing, you know what's your presentation, then you will be confident. So prepare yourself for practice. And then practice your speech for an effective presentation. And presenting your talk to your audience, you need to practice. That's why our world-class athletes, they practice for how many hours a day? Every day until competition, right? Let's say, Olympics is four years. You have to practice for four years and then they compete. But I love saying this one. Uh, practice makes progress instead of perfect. So we don't have to aim for perfection. Progress is really important. And remember, 1% progress every day that will lead or convert to 365% of improvement. That's another chapter. The last chapter of my book is telling your story. Writers are also a messenger of their story. That's why he put it in a book, just like in Eunice's case, she wrote a novel. Michelle, she has the compilation of poems. 
what is the importance of telling your story? Use storytelling to make a greater impact. We, are, we all have stories. We are all unique. So share that stories. Share inspiration and motivate others. Okay. In summary, if you're going to observe the third chapter, my first chapter is about communication. The second chapter is organization. And so NFID until the last one, it is telling your story. This book, Say It Loud, Say It Proud, is all about confidence. As I mentioned earlier, confidence starts within. It's inside of us. So that's all the nine chapters of the book. And for the audience, future audience, if they want to connect with me, I'm into YouTube. I have my channel. I'm also into Facebook with my Facebook page. I'm in LinkedIn and Instagram, and they can email me. So I would like to say thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bernard. That ends my presentation. All right. That is great. I'm just checking here. Do we have a, uh, here we go. We'll get us back. All right. We are back now. So many thoughts running through my mind as I'm listening to all of that, because there's so much good stuff in that book. And I can't remember all my thoughts now that I liked at the end when you talked about telling a story and everybody has a story, right? Yeah. Everybody has something that they can say that they can share and communicate with others. Um, I I took a little peek for a couple more questions because we got a little Absolutely. bit more time. <laughs> so this, um, I'm kind of getting uh, from you that you're a very goal oriented person. So then for your writing process, I suspect, do you have like a routine each day you try and sit down for a certain amount of time and work on your writing? Is that kind of how you go about it? Last year when I'm writing the book, I have at least two to four hours last year. Mm -hmm. But they said, if you have at least 15 minutes every day, then that will convert to 1,000 words. So my suggestion to anybody who wants to start writing a book, allocate a time. You can, it can be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour a day. As I mentioned earlier, let's aim for progress and not perfection. Mm -hmm. So one percent progress every day. As, as long as you do it consistently, then that is three hundred sixty-five percent. Yes, yeah. That was another thing I remember that I really liked that you said. Yeah, that some of us uh, can get very frustrated with ourselves if we don't achieve as much as we think we should but you have to remember to not just look at everything you didn't do but look at what you actually did do and That's recognize right. that and and acknowledge that and reward yourself that you did you took a couple steps you know you're not all the way there but you, you did some <laughs> celebrate that small win every day and that um rather than you becoming more frustrated it, it helps you build that confidence again, right? I did that yesterday. What can I do today now? I can do a little yeah, more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Some tasks are so huge. They overwhelm us, right? So it take a little bit. Yeah, the question is, how do you go into eat the whole elephant, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you think that, how can I eat this big elephant? Of course, start with a small bite. No, no, I don't know if I want to eat that. <laughs> no, sorry, but, but okay. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Pizza, maybe I'll go that way. <laughs> but uh, now, here's an interesting question. Um, did you edit anything out of your book? Like, was there something you were going to put in and then you decided, no, that's not yes. going in? Uh, I did a lot of salt editing. And then I ask help from my family. And then we seek the help of professional editor. And then another friend who is also an editor. So there's like, how many editor? Me, a self-editor. And then my family, my son and wife. That's three. And then there are 
the real editor, and then another friend who is also into editing. So like five people edited the book. So, but yeah, it starts with me. When I'm writing it and I don't like it, scratch it and then write another one, something like that. So was there anything that got taken out then that you were very sorry or sad that it didn't get to stay in the book? Yes, there's some few. Yeah, there's is, some few, yeah. Is but, there anything yeah. secret you want to tell us? That you <laughs> want to I think book? I remove about that, uh, what part of that, uh, in that storytelling part. I want that storytelling part in the, in the end, but they suggested to put it some part in the front. Oh, then, uh, okay. yeah. So, so they shuffled it around on it. Kind of shuffled. But again, sometimes it, your editor and the writer should agree to one thing, right? You can always say no if you don't like that. But if you will, again, as part of the chapter of my book is evaluation, right? We're asking for evaluation yes. so that we can improve or we will will improve. So follow the evaluations and feedback. But at the end of the day, the decision is on the writer itself or the author. But of course, you are working with a team, let's say in this process, my editor and my mentor. So I have to follow some of their, their advice. Mm -hmm. I remember when you said the part about the evaluation too, just um, in life, sometimes somebody tells you something or, or gives you a critique and maybe you're not so happy with it. So I know for myself, my first reaction is to want to, oh, I'm mad about that. I didn't like that. But then you take that moment and step back and go, okay, like Eunice mentioned, I'm going to think about that again. Was there something good that I can take out of there? Maybe they had a point. <laughs> so yeah. our yeah. first reaction is sometimes to be upset, um, but it is good to look back and see if there's a oh. good point in there. <laughs> Okay, last question for you. Um, now, I'm not sure how this goes because I haven't published a book myself, but uh, do you get an advance payment? Like you get your first payment. Let's just put it this way. They, they said, what did you do with your first advance? But I can ask you just, what did you, what did you do with your first payment that you got for your book? What did you spend it on? <laughs> well, actually, I save it. I save it for the next book. And then, and then a part of it, uh, a friend, they need a, what do you call this one? Donation because his father died. Oh. And so we donated a portion of that. Yeah. And then the rest, there's still some in the bank, but slowly was able to use it for, because pandemic comes in, right? So yes. I, got, I have no job. Like I'm just receiving something from the so-called CERB. So use some of that. But that's okay. What is important there is a portion of that, actually a big portion of that, we were able to give it to a friend. Well, there you go. That's wonderful. I mean, some people will go and, and spend it on something fancy, but it's smart. You save some and also um, it allows you to share with others. Your good fortune can help others. So. Yeah. But that's wonderful. All right. I think it is time. Oh, we can do the clapping. I don't know if the other people know how to clap virtually for you or not. I might clap for real. <laughs> there oh, there's some real Thank clapping you. coming on. <laughs> oh, Thank you. you <laughs> Look at that. Virtual one going. I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. You can join us again there, Eunice, with your video. And we'll do our little fun wrap-up game that I have for us. So, I wanted um, to do a quiz on Alberta with our authors to see what they know. And I found kind of a funny one here, which is about Alberta slang. So <laughs> words and terms that are used especially in Alberta and see if you know what they mean. So I gave this quiz a little uh, go last night. I found it, I should give credit to a website called quizbliss.com. That's where I found it. But I gave it a try. And apparently I got 100%. I don't know. I was guessing on some of those things. But if we'll do this as a little bit of a, a contest between you guys. So Eunice, you can unmute your, 
your mic too, just in case you've got an answer you want to tell. So just like stick your hand up or or just shout it out if you think you know. I don't know. If we're getting too unruly, I'll, I'll wheel you back a bit and we'll go back to, you know. But uh, there are multiple, well, they have multiple choice in here, but I'm not going to read those. I'm just going to see if you know it because some of you guys might just know these, okay? So here's the first Alberta slang. What is a double double? Oh, Kimmy. Oh, two Michelle, two she, she beat you. Michelle was first. What is it? It's a uh, two cream, two sugar oh. coffee. <laughs> Are we all in agreement? Yes. Yes. I work for Good that job. one, actually. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Here, here's another one. Here's another one. If you're going to Cowtown, where are you going? Edmonton. Oh. oh Cow Dairy. <laughs> hey, oh, what, what was that, Michelle? Oh, I think uh, someone else answered it. Oh, Vaughn, did you get it? Cowtown. Oh, no, no, I have no idea. But he I has no idea. Calgary. Okay. I guess it's Calgary. You are correct, sir. It is Calgary, oh. known as Cowtown. All right. Now, here's another one. What is a jam buster? Jam buster. Oh, oh. Michelle. <laughs> uh, I think it's a donut, isn't it? Can you give me a little more information about this donut? <laughs> okay. It's a uh, dough donut with jam inside. I, Vaughn, you want to add to that answer a little bit? Michelle is almost there, but my my guess is about jelly. Jelly. This, this is what I'm going. Jam, jelly. Is it the same? Do we accept the? But yes, basically, it's a jelly filled donut. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now this one I had never heard of myself before, and I don't even know if I'll say it right. <clears throat> Practicing. Okay. If someone tells you to tack a tish, they're saying what? Tack a tish. T A K I T I S H. Any ideas? Can I guess the word or yeah. the phrase? Take, ahead, take it easy. Um, well, they're actually telling, we're not getting another phrase, but um, they're telling you to do something. Oh. What are they telling you to do? Tacketish. Tacketish. Not take it easy. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the multiple answer version then. Okay. Because this one's a little bit harder. All right. So are they telling you to talk faster, oh. to hold your horses and take them to the barn, or to take it easy? There you go. Maybe take it. Talk faster, hold your horses, take them to the barn, or take it easy. What do you think it is? Take it easy. Um, I'll try again. The horse one? Nope. <laughs> oh. Apparently, it's to talk faster. Oh, I, right. I guess you guys haven't heard that one. I hadn't heard that one before either. So. Tacketish. 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 Yeah, there's a new one for you. Okay, this one. If somebody gives you a bunny hug, what are they giving you? Hmm. In other words, what's a bunny hug? Bunny hug. Bunny hug. Okay, I'll give you the multiple choice version. So, have they given you a hooded sweatshirt? Are they giving you the middle finger? <laughs> or are they giving you a kiss? A kiss. A bunny a hug. Kiss. Is it a hooded sweatshirt, the middle finger, or a kiss? What do you think? What yes, do you think? Sweatshirt. What was it that Vaughn said? Uh, sweatshirt. Oh. I go for sweatshirt too. You Same with sweatshirt. Me. Eunice yes. says sweatshirt. Michelle, are you in agreement? Uh, just for fun, I'll, I'll say kiss. Just for fun, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is the sweatshirt. A bunny yeah. hug. It's your sweatshirt with a hood on it. Okay. I got two more for you here. If someone is bushed, this is the word pushed what are they they're tired that's what i always thought they put a different one on here though any well, other i saw michelle fair. nod for yeah i know <laughs> i saw a nod from michelle any other thoughts what bushed might be no, i have no idea you know? 
Yeah, well, one of this uh, says indoctrinated to believe George W. Bush is their savior, but I don't think that's <laughs> the right one. <laughs> the other one they've got here, is it they're gassy because they've eaten too many beans? <laughs> or are they uncivilized? Uncivilized. In this case, they took uncivilized, but when I use that term, I always use it for meaning I'm tired. I'm bushed. Oh, okay. Uncivilized. Yeah. Yeah, I usually use it for being tired, but okay. Last one here. Now, this one you'll probably have heard before. If you're a rink rat, what are you? A rink rat. What does that I watch a lot of hockey. Yeah. Watch a lot of hockey. Michelle, what was your answer? Hockey player. Hockey player. Anything, Vaughn, you want to throw in, in there? <laughs> rink rat. I'll rink go for rat. hockey player. Hockey player. I, guess I would call a hockey player a rink rat. Basically, it's someone who hangs out at the arena a lot. So a hockey player would fall into the category, right? On here, they actually put that it's somebody who works at a hockey rink. But I think basically anyone who is there like all the time. <laughs> you like know, a parent. <laughs> Even a parent of the hockey player of the figure skating, if you're like a rink rat because you're there all the time. That's a very Albertan thing to do. So, <laughs> all right. I'm going to thank all my authors. Thank you, Vaughn. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you to the folks who've been watching from home. Maybe in the future we can do something like this in person, but thank you for still giving the virtual a go because. I was really glad we at least have this and we still had a wait for these authors to be able to share, right? Otherwise we would have to just cancel it all together. So, all right. And if you want to check out um, their books, you can take them out from the library. You can come and pick some up from the library. So yes. yeah, that's awesome. I'm excited to uh, let folks know because there are way more authors and Peloton folks in our community than we realize, right? So. We want to get that word out and let you share those talents with everybody. All right. Any other parting words anyone wanted to share? No, but thank you again. You're welcome. And it was lots of fun. Yes. I'm but... glad you had fun. I made you all laugh at at least one point, I think. So you that's did good, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was nervous coming in, but you made it lighthearted, which was really yes. nice. So Right. Wonderful. right. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I enjoyed yeah. the game, Sack. I love the games. Yay. And uh, yeah, when I first took a job here working, doing programs with adults, I was a little bit nervous because mostly I worked with kids. Can you tell? But anyways, <laughs> my dad says to me, don't forget, you are one. So if I'm an adult and I enjoy having fun, I guess some other adults might enjoy having some fun too, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. That's there funny. we go. I'm glad that you were able to have some fun. All right. Well, wave to the folks. Bye. And say bye. Thanks so much, everybody.